for animals our exciting series where we've teamed up with the animal advocacy group animals for action barbados and it's our welfare series where hopefully we're enlightening and educating you to the proper care for our animals whether your animals are domestic or livestock or if they're birds or fish or even reptiles and I don't know about you, but I'm certainly learning quite a lot. I know last week we said that, you know, we'd be touching on snakes today. However, the snake, well, I don't know, are they farmers? But the guy at the uh, sanctuary, he is out of the island, so we will be chatting with him next week. But this week, today, our guest is black belly sheep farmer Khalil Roberts and I'm certainly looking forward to this chat. I've learned that the Barbados black belly sheep is considered and hailed across the world to be a hardy sheep. Well adapted to tropical conditions, says here, with a high tolerance of parasites, is able to survive by grazing tropical grasses of poor quality even in severe tropical heat and humidity. And sales of the sheep are noted to the US, Indonesia, and more recently to Guyana. But before we chat with Khalil, let's visit his farm with Action for Animals liaison, Gail Hunt. So Khalil, one of the things that I noticed is that you were giving them lots of water. Yes, so please. average on average day, how much water do black belly sheep need? Well, it depends from day to day. Mm -hmm. Typically, it depends a lot on how hot outside it is, the type of feeds they're being given, etc. So I cannot give you a straightforward answer in terms of how much they would drink per animal. Right. But what I do, typically, because I have other things to do during the day, because I'm a university student, yeah. I give them the maximum amount of water that I believe they would require. Okay. So for this pen over here, they typically get a full bucket of water every morning and on evenings, depending on how well they drank it, I would give them a second bucket of water. I see. So if the, if the uh, water has gone right down, you will know that they will need some more some water, water yes. in the evening. Okay. Um, these ewes here, yes. they tend to go outside and graze fresh grass, so they don't require large amounts of water. So typically, when they fill this blue drum here, this half drum yeah. of water, it would typically take them about two days to finish it, as long as outside isn't too hot. But there, there are some days when outside is extremely hot, there is no wind, extremely humid, yes. and they consume large amounts of water. So sometimes, instead of taking two days to drink this, they would drink two of those in one day. Right. Um, again, it also depends on the type of forages they're getting. These rams that stay inside the pen, they get a lot of hay, which is drier grass, and they consume a lot of feed, et cetera. Sense. So they would require a lot more water than the ewes which go outside to graze. Yeah, they get the moisture from the grass. Exactly. Yes. We'll continue with our visit to Khalil's farm after the break. Today it's all about the black belly sheep and we are at Khalil Roberts farm today on Action for Animals and I don't know if you're like me but I've been wondering why are the rams inside and the ewes outside? Well here's the reason. Well I operate a semi-intensive system 
So typically my ewes, they are reared extensively. They spend a lot of time outside grazing because they are the largest group. It, it lowers my expense, my cost, to have them outside and graze as much as possible. Whereas the rams, I rear them inside because I tend to get better results raising them intensively in terms of giving them concentrates, monitoring the amount of grass they consume every day. It is a more controlled system when they keep the rams inside. But again, if you could take a look, you could see that these ewes in here, some would be heavy in condition, some would not be in so much condition, and that is because all of them are in different stages of their life cycle. I breed my ewes in groups, so I typically tend to have at least three ewes that are heavily pregnant at a time, at least two or three, sometimes four, that have lambs at a time, some that are being bred and some that would have just had lambs weaned off of them. So those ewes that would have just had lambs, they would not go into the pasture with those very young lambs. They would spend at least a week, sometimes two weeks, inside of the pen being reared intensively to ensure that the lambs are getting the proper nutrition and attention that they may require. So in terms of nutrition, what types of foods, beyond the dried grass mm -hmm. and going up to pasture for the ewes, and the rams also, what types of nutritional um, foods do you give them? Well, to supplement the grazing as the forages that they eat, I tend to either mix my own rations yeah. or sometimes I might purchase feeds. Um, in general, for anyone who is starting out, I would employ them to buy either a sheep and goat ration okay. or an all-purpose ration. They tend to do the best job in terms of meeting all the requirements of the sheep in general. For my purposes though, I tend to buy a lot of ingredients in bulk and formulate rations that suit the particular life stages of each animal. Okay. For instance, these younger lambs over here, they will be getting a higher protein ration as well as the other young lambs in this pen over here. Um, the older rams, they do not require such high amounts of protein. They tend to get a lot more energy in their ration, so a lot more molasses, cracked corn, barley, stuff like that. Whereas the ewes, because they spend so much time outside grazing, etc., they already get a lot of energy from the fresh green grass. So I tend to just supplement them in terms of their minerals. Um, a lot of the time, when I could get um, waste food from the supermarkets, etc., yeah. I would give it to them as just a boost to them. But the fact that they spend so much time outside grazing, they don't necessarily require a lot of care or attention when it comes to supplemental feeds. Okay, so they get a lot of what they need from nature, basically. Exactly. All righty. And in terms of like, I know with dogs and cats, you have to worm them also with horses. Yes, please. Is it the same thing with black belly sheep? Of course. Um, one of the things that sets our breed apart from others is that they're extremely hearty. They tend to be very parasite resistant but that doesn't mean that they're parasite immune. So I tend to limit my deworming as well as antibiotic treatments to crucial points of their life stages. So for lambs, that would be directly after weaning. For ewes, directly before breeding and during the weaning process. For my breeding ram, I tend to wean him, sorry, worm him yeah. before he's put into the flock for breeding, etc. And in terms of antibiotics, that could be like a penicillin shot. It could be a treatment with amprolium or trisole or any other, but um, any other antibiotic used to cure what is called a coccidiosis infection. And what's that? Um, a coccidiosis infection, it is typically a bacterial infection picked up from the soil when they're eating, especially when they graze grass very close to the ground. And it kind of, what it does, it it invades and it colonizes their small intestine. Right, quick question. How will you know if a sheep has that condition? What are the signs? Um, for one, they would tend to lose a lot of weight very rapidly. Um, they have very soft, watery stools, that smell of sulfur. And typically, if you were to check them, like their eyes or their lips, yeah. they become very anemic. Because what happens is the bacteria, as it colonizes the intestine, it kind of rips the intestinal wall and it stops them from absorbing the nutrients from their food. 
So when, when is it time to call the vet? What, what kind typically would, would mean that you need to bring the vet in to, to look at your sheep? Typically, the times that I've called the vet would be when things become extremely dire. But as a, as a farmer, there are certain things you have to know to do on your own. You cannot typically rely on the vet all the time for what, certain things. What things are those? Um, the same schedule in terms of deworming, yes. coxie treating, as well as simple things, because sometimes they might go into the pasture and become injured. You would have to know how to treat small lacerations on your feet, how to trim their hooves, how to do certain checks for yourself to see if they're anemic or anything along right. those lines. But I would never tell someone if they do not know to try to do it on their own. They should always consult a professional. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're now going to have a look at the beautiful pasture. No where problem. The, where the ewes graze. Mm -hmm. But they don't go outside until they go outside. What? You, you, you got them trained? Yeah. Go up, girls. Go up. Come, 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 come. Go up. Come up. Go up. Go inside. No, no, no. Go inside. So Khalil, one of the things that I noticed was when they came out of the pen, they were immediately heading to go um, through the main gates yes. to, the, to the larger pasture. Yeah. But you, you mentioned that they don't go through the gates unless you command them to, so you have them trained as well. Um, I can't necessarily say that they're trained. Okay. It's more so that they have grown accustomed to me, so they tend to follow my instructions. I can't say it's like training a dog no. where you give them rewards or treats for good behavior. It's more so a bond that they would have nurtured over time because a lot of these ewes that are in here, the majority of them were bred and born here through generations of selection. So they would have grown up around me, yes. grown accustomed to me, and they trust me. Yeah, that's what I was gonna so, ask you. They obviously must trust you quite a lot. Yes, so for instance, if you were to try to do that, they would have ran helter skelter yes. around the whole paddock. Yeah, the they would have ran back into the pen and they would not have come out. But because of the trust and the bond that we would have nurtured over so many years, they would follow me. Literally, if I were to take them into the bigger pasture, they would walk behind me like puppies. That's beautiful, Khalil. Mm -hmm. It really is. So how many sheep do you have typically? Typically, I tend to hover between 30 and 50 sheep. Um, right now, I have about 40. And the reason is, as I have lambs, I tend to also send rams to the market. Okay. So it's a bit of like a cycle. So yeah. between my lambing sessions, I also always have a session where I send rams to the market and afterwards I will have lambs weaned yeah. and I sell lambs constantly. So I find that that is the amount that I can manage properly because I do not want to reach a point where I have too many to manage. So it's all about the balance and, and the Correct. welfare. Yeah, Action for Animals is all about the welfare of animals and it's really, it's really heartening to see that you're taking such good care of your black belly sheep from when they're lambs right through to so adult become adult. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. That was an excellent tour. And we have Khalil with us in studio today. And Khalil, how, how did you get involved in sheep farming and, and why? Well, I was involved in sheep farming for as long as I could remember, to be 
honest with you, I don't remember a time where I didn't have something to do either with sheep or chickens or cows, even pigs sometimes, because I would have grown up with my grandparents and these are things that I would have been raised doing. Okay, so over the years, what have you learned? Because while we were watching, you mentioned that there are various stages of their development. Yes. So how, how does that development differ over the various stages? Well, I have heard, learned a lot, not only dealing with the animal husbandry side of things, but also in terms of the business side, but focusing in more on the raising of the sheep. There are certain things you must know in terms of their nutrition at the different stages. For example, the younger animals, they would require a lot more care in terms of their protein levels, um, the amount of feedings and how frequently you have to feed them, their concentrates, etc. But as they get older, there is a bit of a shift into supplementing their energy, especially the ewes, which, as I would have said in the interview, they are raised extensively for the majority of their productive lives. Mm. So you focus more on making sure that they're met with their, maybe their amino acid profiles are correct, their vitamins, their minerals, and in, especially when they're during that lactating phase or that phase where they're getting ready to give birth, they require quite a bit of energy to supplement those lambs that they're okay. raising. Well, how, do you, how do you know that perhaps they need more amino acids and, and or maybe they need less or fewer you know um how do you know is this something you can tell by looking at them by changes in their behavior H how do you know yes exactly it is similar to how for instance if you are taking care of a child uh, although they cannot speak to you they will just cry or they will fret up or whatever you can tell and you will notice a stark difference in how they behave. Sometimes they may seem a bit droopy when they're out on the field, they move slowly or they're dragging their feet, they're holding their heads down, they're not as lively as they should be. Um, there are certain physical signs and symptoms of disease. For example, sometimes you might find they have very watery stools or diarrhea. Um, you can look at their eyes, the lining of their eyes and their gums to tell whether or not they are anemic. And this could be due to several reasons. For example, a high um, load of internal parasites or even ticks, etc. And the more experience you have doing it, these things come very easily. It's, it's almost night and day the difference between a healthy and mm -hmm. a sick animal. Okay. You mentioned the the business side. What do we need to know about that? Um, say someone wanted to get into sheep farming. Yeah, there is the rearing and raising of the animals, but what about the business side? Well, a lot of persons who are into sheep farming would describe it as a hobby, but really and truly, to make a profit in sheep farming, there are several things you need to get right. For instance, you have to have a productive flock, first and foremost. By that you mean? By that I mean whether you are in it for the production of lamb sales, meaning selling weaned lambs at a particular age, or you're in it for the production of milk, as some persons are, you're in it for the production of meat, either mutton or lamb. Your flock should be always productive in that particular area. In the case of my flock, I dabble in all the different areas in terms of lamb sales, the production of meat, etc. So in terms of managing my flock, first and foremost, I always choose the best animals that are producing the product that I want. So it requires you to have a very selective eye. You must always go through your flock and call out those persons or animals that do not particularly live up to the expectations that you want. And on the other end is a lot about marketing your products. So that could be either advertising, either on Facebook or developing your market, either if you sell personally or you sell to supermarkets, etc. You have to have that set up 
and you must always have a constant supply to your market so that you do not have down periods where you're just outing money on feed or you're spending a lot of money trying to purchase lambs to raise and you're not getting any returns. Mm. So it is a lot about how you manage your flock. Is the price fixed in terms of uh, sale of the sheep or lamb or is the price fixed in terms of buying lambs? Yes. What I would say is it fluctuates a bit depending on the price of feed, um, the availability of grass, um, the availability of water. But for the most part, the market price for a lamb, the meat, tends to be around 11 to $12 per pound. When you're buying or selling animals, what you would call live weight or a live, typically it's around 4 to $5 per pound. But due to certain factors, it tends to be increasing steadily. Mm. Personally, I try to stay a bit below the market price to stay competitive in my pricing. And that then plays into the whole marketing of your product. And plus too, we heard, I know while we were watching you with Gail um, and your animals, you also seem to have some kind of scientific formula of mixing <laughs> your feed and so on. Yes. Um, mm. For the most part, I try to source my feed in bulk and I am always looking for the cheaper option and also the sustainable option because it makes no sense that you could get a particular feed stuff once a year and you have to go and you have to buy it at the time rate and then you have to look for ways to store it, etc. Even though it's a bulk buy, it wouldn't be, it is a risky investment. Okay. You mentioned the word sustainable and I immediately brought a thought, but I'm going to talk to you about that yeah. when, in terms of organic farming, because mm -hmm. that's such a, you know, a, a, a term these days in terms of sustainability and, and perhaps better practices. But we're going to ask you about that when it comes to sheep farming and, and your, your business. We're going to find out about that when we come back. We're chatting with Khalil Roberts, who is a black belly sheep farmer who is wise and experienced beyond his years. And it's certainly educational for us. We see the black belly sheep and, and, and you know, we buy lamb, we buy mutton, um, we consume it. But what is it really like to be a farmer and to have to take into consideration all of these things? price of feed, you know, the type of grass you might have within your environment, how much water they will need. So we were talking, you mentioned the word sustainable farming, yes, and I'm asking you about organic farming. And mm -hmm. how does that play a role? Is it different from what you do? How does that play a role in farming practices in general these days? Well, to set the stage, in terms of the differences between organic farming and the traditional uh, farming in the tra traditional sense. Um, you have to look at organic farming not as just one single thing, but it is a holistic thing. It, con it encompasses several different areas. So to show the difference, farming in a traditional sense it tends to be very streamlined. It's just focused on production, 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 production of one single product. And that is when you get issues like monocropping or issues of overpopulation in your farm or you have issues where you leach nutrients from the soil, etc. Whereas when you're doing organic farming, you tend not to focus on one particular thing. There are several different things you're doing and they all work and play off of each other to enhance your products. Mm -hmm. So when I think of organic farming of black barbados, black mini sheep, 
I look not only at the production of meat, but also the production of the manure. And I use this to fertilize my paddocks and my fields for when it's time for the rainy season, when the rain falls, you have a very good spring and production of grass around you. Um, I've also looked into not only focusing on using concentrate in the sense of a capellated feed, but also looking for ways to get byproducts of industries here in Barbados. Mm. So I tend to use a lot of bagasse, a lot of molasses, a lot of spent grain. What's that? Spent grain mm. is like, for instance, when banks bruise their beers, etc. Oh, okay. They left over hulls and stuff from uh -huh. the barley and hops that they use. I use that to mix my feeds, etc. Nice. So things that in a traditional sense would be considered waste products, I use these to help feed my animals and in turn produce a new product. So it is in an effort not only to reduce costs, but also find ways of taking things that other ways would have just been thrown away, would have gone to the dump or may have been burnt. I use it for my production. Do you also, speaking of waste, um, do you look to sell the manure as well to, to well, other farmers? It is something that I'm looking into because the sale of manure is something that could be quite lucrative. The sheep manure is apparently excellent. Yeah. But the thing is, it would require me to invest in mm. certain machinery not only to clean it out, but also it requires certain processes in order to get it to the to a more refined stage that I could get a better price for. So okay. at this current time, I tend to use it for myself. I may give away some to a few friends. Any farmers who are interested in my area that would like some, they would come and take it for themselves too. How many lambs do you get per you, per year? And how many times per year are they the used bread? Well, on average, you will get a twin birth with a black belly sheep. And that is a oh. trait that is somewhat unique to the Barbados black belly sheep. They're extremely prolific. And not only that, but with proper maintenance, you could be bred twice within a 12 month okay. period. Within 12 months? Correct. So to give a bit of a timeline, it takes about five months from breeding until birth. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, you breed in January, you will get your first birth in May. And it takes about eight weeks or so until the lambs are ready to be weaned off of their mothers in an intensive environment. And immediately after weaning or even during the weaning period, the ewes can come back into heat and have their heat cycles and they can be bred again. So that maybe if they are bred again at between if they're born in May and they're bred again in July, towards the end of the year, around December, that's when you get your second lambing. We talk about the ewes and lambs a lot. Let's talk about the rams, because <laughs> they have this reputation um, of being really cranky and, and aggressive. Um, yeah, they could be. Okay, so they're not all like that. They're not all like that. Um, it may seem somewhat oxymoronic, but the friendlier the rams are, the more aggressive they are. What? The friendlier they are, the more aggressive they are. And that has to deal with the sense of competition. Because in the wild, the rams, when they're out, they have to be very aggressive. They have to be these big macho men to defend their flock of views against not only predators, but also other rams. So if this particular ram, your breeding ram, whatever, gets accustomed to you, and he realizes that you're always among his ewes, or whatever, especially when it's time for breeding, he would have these urges to defend his ewes from you and wow. he sees you as competition. Whereas, for instance, a ram that is kind of shy, kind of reserved, he would more tend to take all of his ewes together and gather them and run away with them instead of confronting you. Wow. And it also has to do with how they're raised. I find rams that I have to bottle feed from young tend to be the ones that they don't have that fear or that tendency to run away. They will always come to confront you, especially around feeding time and breeding time. Do you ever get <coughs> attached to any of your animals? Yes, of course. More so my ewes and my breeding rams. Yeah. Because those are the ones that 
I put a lot of energy and work into and maintaining, etc. I, I can't believe that our time has flown <laughs> so quickly already. Um, and we saw Gail brushing and, you know, that's another way that you keep them healthy, brushing their coats. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any advice quickly? A few seconds we have left. Um, my advice to anyone who is looking to get into sheep farming or farming on a whole, I would advise you to get close to someone who has experience in the field, someone who can mentor you and help you to make the best decisions possible in terms of your operation. Okay. Thank you, Khalil. Thanks for having me. Well, this has been really, really interesting. And if you have any problems, um, any livestock issues that you would like to address, you can always contact um, the Government Veterinary Services in the Pine. And believe you me, there is an act which prevents cruelty to animals. It's the Barbados Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. So. You can report cruelty to government veterinary services in the Pine and the RSPCA, I know, and those vet services also uh, respond to uh, animals in danger. Thank you for that bit of information, Khalil, because it's always good to know. And thank you for joining us today. And looking forward to having you join us next time. We welcome you to Action for Animals. <laughs>